Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Pasord, and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London, and I'm delighted now to be joined by Charlotte Hanlon. Charlotte Hanlon is a psychiatrist uh, based in the Department of Psychiatry at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, and she's linked to the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. So Charlotte, welcome. Tell us a little bit about how you, as a uh, sounding like a British psychiatrist, ended up in Ethiopia. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for interviewing me today. Um, so I started off um, always being interested in psychiatry as a medical student and always wanting to work overseas and considering that that might be incompatible. Um, but after my medical elective in Uganda, um, I saw some preliminary efforts that were going on in, in that hospital about trying to reach out and provide care to people with mental health problems. Um, and I started to get interested and think that this was something that was a bit neglected um, and that there could be a role um, for somebody like me in this sort of work. Um, and then when I came to the Institute of Psychiatry, um, the Ethiopian mental health researchers came over and presented their fantastic research, their huge internationally renowned epidemiological studies of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And they were very inspiring. And I thought, OK, let me work with these guys. And I was lucky enough to get a fellowship. And I did my PhD from 2004 to 2006 in Ethiopia, based here for fieldwork. And then I've been back here since 2009 and part of the Department of Psychiatry in Addis Ababa University. So you have to be a bit careful when you start on this kind of journey. <laughs> yeah. OK, great. Um, OK. OK. So um, tell us a bit about what it's like to practice psychiatry in what may be described as a low income country compared to somewhere like the UK. So um, we are based or I am based um, for my clinical work in a big general hospital in Addis Ababa and services at present are very centralised. Um, so most of the population struggles to access services. So we see very severe cases, people who've often waited a really long time before they've been able to come to care. Um, and the kind of cases we see, the kind of, of way that people present um, is often really similar when it comes to severe mental disorders like schizophrenia. Um, so the way, the kind of, of problems that people have, so beliefs that are not in keeping with with reality and hearing things that are not there. Those sort of things we see in the same way that I would in the UK. And we see people having severe impairment of their ability to do their day-to-day -day life, that kind of problem. But the kind of the content of, of say, beliefs, delusions um, and their hallucinations are really different and very much coloured by the cultural context here. So often more religious in content um, and also not just influenced by the cultural context, but also the political context. There's a lot of unrest recently, although settled now. And, and so some persecutory beliefs can, can be fueled by that kind of, of context as well. So, um, and, and the background context of poverty, I think, is really important as well in, in sort of fueling the way people present their symptoms and their concerns are often very around sort of um, issues around survival, um, which you wouldn't see quite so starkly if you're sitting in London. My experience of seeing people in um, low income countries is the other interesting thing is the definition of what it is to be well is different. My experience of seeing, um, for example, what might be described as a witch doctor's clinic in a very remote part of Kenya was as long as people could return to work, working the fields from yeah. uh, as a recovery from the serious mental illness, they were considered well. But to a Western psychiatrist, that didn't necessarily seem to be what we would equate with wellness. I wondered what your thoughts are about that and what your experience is. Yeah, I think that very much accords um, with what we see. So although I work in a clinic in Addis, a lot of my work is involved in trying to expand care into more rural areas um, through integration of mental health care and primary care. So when we do community-based work, we see people who really, as I say, are very much delayed in accessing care. And then when they do, you know, even 
a marginal improvement, um, you know, because of the need to kind of get back to work because of survival. There's no social safety net. There's no disability payment. So if people can't work, um, it has huge implications for themselves and for the household. So, yeah, even with a lot of symptoms, they go back to work. But one of um, the really interesting things um, from my colleagues work in Ethiopia was that the outcome uh, the functional outcome of people with schizophrenia in Ethiopia was not as good as had been implied by some previous studies. And what we find is that people say that they're working, but when we ask them about how well they're working, how well their farm work is being completed, they're actually quite severely impaired. So um, people may perhaps romanticise what, what farming activities involve and, and feel that you don't have to be um, very functional to be able to complete it. But actually, what we see in a lot of our studies is that actually um, the timing of the work, the strenuousness, and actually, you know, some of the skill of ploughing and, and being able to, to do farming work is really can be affected by, by mental health problems. So people may be at work, but they may not be working, you know, optimally, and that still may lead to problems for themselves and their family. You've mentioned that there often is a big delay before people receive treatment. Um, can I ask what kind of happens to them during that delay? I remember again talking to a psychiatrist who worked in low income countries, and he believed that the most common psychiatric treatment worldwide, particularly in low income countries, is what he described as being tied to a tree. Um, so what's your experience in Ethiopia? So I think... Um... There is some truth in that. Um, so we've just conducted a study. We've been trying to expand mental health care into a district where there's absolutely no mental health care provision at the moment. Um, at baseline, when we interviewed 300 people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, in the in the past year, in the year before we, we brought them into our study and started giving them care, 25% of them had experienced being restrained in some way at home um, because of vulnerability, their family being concerned about, you know, that they would bring harm on themselves, be exploited, be vulnerable to abuse or cause harm to other people because of lack of access to care. So that is something that can happen. People become homeless. Studies from my Ethiopian colleagues have shown premature mortality, which is partly because of um, homelessness and sort of um, and falling through the gaps because there's no social safety net. And of course, a lot of people would, will seek help from uh, traditional and religious healing um, places. And that's common in Ethiopia where I work. So holy water sites that are part of the Orthodox Christian um, healing um, interventions, and they're very commonly accessed. But even within the holy water sites, um, people may actually be left there for an extended period of time and during that time may be restrained for periods as well. So sometimes we say in Ethiopia that we don't we don't have a problem of institutionalization. We don't have too many hospitals. We rather have kind of a lack of psychiatric um, specialist care and and that some of the institutionalization is actually happening through traditional and religious healing sites. Are there any other key findings you may want to let us know about from that very interesting study you just talked about where you surveyed people suffering from a serious mental illness? So um, we've also looked, my colleagues and myself have also looked at other sort of factors associated with having a severe mental illness and not being able to access care. So um, stigma, discrimination are very important, as they are in many other cases. And so I've said that restraint, you know, is often because of lack of care and, and people being the only way that families feel they can manage a person. But of course, there can also be abuses against people as well. Um, we found that households are impoverished, that there are higher levels of food insecurity, where who's got a severe mental health problem. So that's the kind of the consequence of not having access to evidence-based treatment. And we're also now, we're doing a lot of projects to try and, as I say, expand access to mental health care. And we're starting to sort of see the first findings about the impact of being able to bring care much closer to people's homes so they're able to access it more easily 
through walking distance rather than spending a lot of money on transport, for example. Um, and um, I mean, it's a bit early to say, but we are showing, for example, reductions in the proportion of people who are restrained. Um, so which is in keeping with what we'd expect, because we're conceptualizing and understanding that people are only restrained in the absence of adequate care. I think that one of your um, um, big interests in, in, in psychiatry is, is this point of how to get care to people who don't normally receive or get care into places where there is no care. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Because I'm assuming what you're referring to is how you get care in a place where there is no psychiatrist. Yeah, that's right. So um, in Ethiopia, we have around 70 psychiatrists for a population of 100 million people. Um, a lot of the mental health care outside of the capital city and the major cities is delivered by psychiatric nurses who are based in, in hospitals. But again, those are still in urban centres. And in Ethiopia, 85% of the population lives rurally. Um, so those those populations are served by primary care and primary care comprises nurses and health officers which are like nurse practitioners and very rarely it, um, you wouldn't be very likely to find a doctor in the primary care setting. So um, one of the districts where we were working for the Prime project, um, which is a DFID funded project, um, when we started off there was no mental health specialist for a population of 160,000 people approach we're taking is to follow um, the WHO approach to integrate mental health in primary care. So we train primary care workers um, for pretty brief periods of time um, using the WHO's uh, evidence-based guidelines and training resources and we've adapted those for our setting and we've added in um, system level supports to try and and make it sustainable and more feasible. But they're basically getting about 10 days training um, and then being asked to provide frontline care. And it's it's interesting because I think this is fairly uncon uncontroversial for depression, for example, that uh, a primary care worker could detect depression and initiate a treatment. But I think the idea of somebody with a severe mental illness the diagnosis being made by a nurse, primary care nurse, having antipsychotic medication initiated, the explanation about the illness given, physical causes of the of the symptoms being ruled out, making a care plan. These are the things we're, we're starting to expect of primary care workers in our setting. Um, and it is very challenging, but we've really been surprised at how far we've been able to go with this so far. So you have people who have not been to medical school and are starting their training from yeah. scratch over 10 days uh, prescribing uh, medication. Is that right? That's right. I mean, most um, most nurses and health officers will have had a very small amount of exposure to psychiatry during their 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 preliminary, their undergraduate training. Um, but usually that doesn't involve clinical exposure because of the lack of, of clinical sites. Um, so it may be very theoretical. And at the time that they were trained, they weren't really expecting to have to deliver mental health care. So really for most people, it's been a few years since they've kind of thought about mental health care and they don't really have any grounding in it. And we are asking a lot of people. So clearly you can't just train people briefly and then sort of throw them in the deep end and hope that that's going to work. So supervision um, and kind of ongoing sort of quality improvement mentoring is is something we're finding is, is clearly crucial to make this work in a safe way. So I'm very interested in what kind of treatments these people are offering, because obviously it sounds like you can offer antipsychotic medication and antidepressant medication, but um, are they doing a form of what we might call cognitive behavioural therapy as well? Um, so one of the challenges is really how to make sure that we are able to provide a biopsychosocial intervention. So not just biological treatments like medications, but also responding to unmet psychological and social needs. Um, and that, so in some ways that's very challenging to do within the existing health system. And I think you could equally say that a high income country health system struggle to actually make sure that that doesn't get lost. Um, so what we try to do is also draw on the community as much as we can. So the primary care workers are trained in sort of um, 
kind of basic counselling techniques and how to to communicate with patients and and to try and set rehabilitation goals. Um, but that's kind of quite a foreign activity for them to do, and it's been quite difficult to get that that working as optimally as the optimally as we would have liked but what we can get them to do is sort of involve the family and through raising awareness and mobilizing the community we're able to sort of address more of the social needs through that way so an example in the prime project would be that um, we've had some homeless people in the district um, and these people are really it's really challenging to get them into care because normally the only way that somebody can come to any kind of health care is if a family member or a well-wisher would bring them to care and take responsibility for them. So they're often, you know, doubly marginalised um, and excluded from care. But what we found is as we started providing a fairly basic and quiet biomedical treatment in the health centres, the community got inspired and, and sort of got some momentum and felt that and and started really pulling together to try and support people they brought the homeless people to um, the treatment setting they helped them to get housing they provided them with support with their basic living so um, that's something perhaps that we can draw on more than we could say in South London or other places in the UK um, where it might not be so easy to mobilize a community around people on the other hand one doesn't want to romanticise that too much because these are very stretched communities um, where pe everybody is somewhat fighting for survival. So there is a limit to how much you can ask of a community. That said, we're over and over again impressed by what communities are able and willing to do for people with mental health problems in their midst. So these people who have been trained for 10 days, what are they called after their 10 days of training? So they're still primary healthcare workers and really we're trying to um, make this part of their job. This is their, we're, we're saying to people and, and the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia is very supportive that that mental health should be an integral role that they should they should take on as part of providing holistic health care. You know, the, the mantra, there is no health without mental health. Um, and this, I think, has, has been well received by the primary care workers in the main. I mean, there are certainly some who struggle to see it as their job. Um, and partly that's because we're adding it on to their job after they've qualified. So one thing we need to do is sort of make it integral to their training all the way through so that it's never seen as an add on. So the, so this is just making more fully trained primary care workers. So these primary um, healthcare workers are already paid by the state. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. They're already a cadre of of healthcare professional that's already there, and they're on government salaries. And um, sorry, sorry to ask these maybe indelicate or um, non politically correct questions, but in a poor country to have a job like that is that is that something that people desire? In a, in other words, is it something? that people want to do because otherwise they face the prospect of unemployment? I think there is still quite a high status um, with delivering health care in Ethiopia. Um, and um, health workers, especially working very close to the community, um, they get a lot of respect from the community. Um, it's very much appreciated. So there is a status um, associated with the job. Um, and I think that's important. On the other hand, um, there's a very high turnover of health workers. Um, so, I mean, they're very young when we interview, go to health centres and interview the different health workers. So the median age is always kind of under 30 and uh, they seem to stay around three years and, and move on um, perhaps to more urban settings, not always lost from the health system. Um, but but there's, it, it's, you don't often find people who stay a very long time in the job. And one of our PhD students has been looking at that from the perspective of burnout and stress um, and to see whether, you know, that's a, an important factor driving the turnover. Um, and it certainly seems to me, seems to be that that, that is uh, an important component I've always felt that given that this kind of work is difficult work, that the kind of people who are, are going to do it and do it well over a sustained period have to be quite passionate about it. And I've yeah. always felt that the selection process doesn't really take that into account, that it doesn't really, in a way that the, 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 the science tends to 
put the weight on the on the training um, the training is important and the knowledge base is important and the skills and the technical element is important but the desire to do it is particularly important in psychiatry as opposed to maybe the rest of medicine or healthcare and, and that bit gets neglected that we need to find people who really want to do it and that that passion um, is unusual given given the, the the difficult nature of this work I don't know what your thoughts are about that yeah I think there's there's definitely truth in that obviously not everybody is sort of skilled particularly kind of innately skilled in the same way to do this kind of work and may not have the same level of interest. I mean, the reality is we we still have to make it part of everybody's job. Um, so I've said there's a high turnover of people. So if we just trained one or two people who had a specific interest in the area, there'd be an enormous risk that they would move on and then suddenly there would be no mental health care within that health centre. Um, but on the other hand, we're able to use these, I hate to say it, but these champions for mental health are really important in sort of keeping the momentum. Um, and so we, we sort of find it naturally within health centres, some people take on more active roles. So some people are more willing to see patients and start the treatments. Some are more willing to detect and refer um, so it does seem to be kind of moving in that direction. But but from a kind of policy point of view, it's very difficult not to take the stance that everybody should be trained and everybody should be expected to deliver a minimum level of care, because otherwise we really can't expand access to, to basic mental health care. How um, is what you're doing in, in, in Ethiopia different to what other low income countries are doing? What what because I think you're you're very interested in providing a model of what the best practice is and then and then um, uh, spreading that across the world. So so how does what you're doing compare to what other people are doing and what looks like the best possible model of doing this? Um, so, well, so what are we doing that's different? Um, I think we're, we're paying a lot of attention to the health system supports that are needed for these kind of models of care to expand mental health care. Um, and so, and Ethiopia's government is very public health orientated. It's very population orientated. So um, it's easy to kind of make the case that we need to look outside of the clinics where people are seeking care and try to be more proactively attending to the needs of the population. So where mental health care is not working as well in other low income countries, um, I think you tend to see more centralised services, more emphasis on just expanding specialist mental health care, an unwillingness to see mental health care as being within the remit of general health care workers. So I think that's um, where things perhaps don't work so well. There are some really interesting and innovative things that are happening, for example, across Africa. So there's um, a couple of really um, interesting trials. One is underway and one's just been um, reported on in the British Journal of Psychiatry. So in Ghana, um, they've been working to try and collaborate with prayer camps to see if they can develop a collaborative model of care whereby people who are seeking help through prayer camps um, have this option to also, um, in a collaborative way, um, also access sort of biomedical care as well. So that's mostly medication, um, and that's that was very interesting. So that that trial showed um, only short term outcomes, but they showed that it did re reduce symptom. Um, burden on the people who had both care combined rather than just traditional care alone. So these sort of innovative ways of thinking about how we're going to work with traditional and religious healers are really important. And there's a trial in, in progress in Nigeria where similarly they're re reporting, they're recruiting people from traditional healing sites and they're randomizing them to carry on just having traditional healing or to also have it augmented um, with primary care workers trained in mental health care. Um, and these are difficult studies, but they're really important because um, we always, everybody always talks a lot about how important it is to try and, and make use and, and work with traditional religious healers. But there's often a lack of specificity about how that's going to work. You know, there's a lack of, of rigorous and systematic evaluation. So these kind of studies are really um, ethically challenging um, because in both of the studies I mentioned, there's been an issue around um, potential abuses uh, happening in the traditional camps and, and what, what do we do about those if they're in the comparison arm. So these are really challenging studies to do, but it's a really important 
and and very innovative i think kind of approach um and and i think that is something that marks out our setting not all african countries are really different um so our, the setup in ethiopia for traditional and religious healing is really different from west africa um but i think what we share in common is that that component is really prominent um in the way that people seek care for mental health problems in our setting so if we ignore it we're not really going to be able to meet people's needs adequately how do you actually go about engaging a traditional or religious healers because i would have thought for a wide variety of reasons they might not be keen or even frankly antagonistic the, the scientific biological or medical model of mental illness might be in direct contradiction to their more spiritual um, approach to, to the causation of mental illness. So they might see you as a threat. Are, are there any thoughts you have from your experience of how to go about engaging with them? Yeah, so, and I would like to say that I don't, I think it's really important not to generalize too widely because countries really vary in the way that these sort of barriers to collaboration operate. So, um, in Ethiopia, there's a big range of religious and traditional healers and some it would be very difficult to collaborate with. So um, the Tankwai is a kind of sorcerer and that's um, a sort of um, a last resort and quite, um, there's a lot of stigma and worry about people accessing that kind of magic. Um, and and it, we find it very difficult to even interview these kind of traditional healers. But if we're talking about holy water, um, then we have good access with the Orthodox Christian priests and, and we find that, there's variation, but often they're quite pragmatic. Um, we're able to draw on some of um, some of the trails that have been blazed by HIV, for example. So originally there were messages that antiretroviral therapy shouldn't be taken together with holy water, but there've been successful campaigns where the Orthodox Church has agreed and sent out messages to their followers that it's okay. And, and so that has become acceptable. So we've been able to do things like that within mental health. And within the Prime Project, we have religious leaders on the advisory board um, for the mental health care expansion. Um, and they've been incredibly constructive and, and helpful about, and about thinking about what their role is and where they can contribute and what our role is. Um, and I think we probably went into it thinking what we would like is to minimise the delay in treatment and use religious healers um, to, for early detection and, and referral. But, but of course, they offer much more than that. And, and we've not fully capitalised on their capacity to help people's recovery in the fullest sense, meaning sort of their spiritual recovery, their, their reintegration into the community. So these are all sort of possibilities. In different countries, though, that I mean, there are studies from South Africa, from Ghana, where there's much more, as you say, suspicion and um, potential of lost trade. Um, so there's there's money at stake if traditional healers are going to lose clients, and there's a, a sort of competition. Um, but I, I think it is difficult to generalise, and it's often possible to find even within that kind of context, it's often possible to find people who are willing to say, actually, I struggle to really improve um, the outcomes for this kind of patient. Perhaps we could work together and both be contributing to care um, in a way that benefits both sides. Um, now, this, this may seem like a very odd question, but um, I, I'm just wondering and intrigued, if you're dealing with a traditional religious healer, um, who has been dealing with serious mental illness for many decades and has finally come into contact with Western medicine. Um, is there anything that Western medicine has to learn from, from those people? Uh, they have a, a wealth of experience. Do, do you think there's something they can offer in terms of new treatment approaches or new insights into serious mental illness? In other words, it's not just one-way traffic, but in terms of uh, how the knowledge was meant the direction of the knowledge flow because scientific western medicine takes the view unless you're doing a randomized double blind controlled trial you're not really getting at real knowledge so th th they have another way of getting at knowledge they have another methodology um it, are there things that we can learn from them yeah i'm sure that is the case um but i i still think there's a, a, an important it's important to be critical um, in the same way that we would be critical of biomedical um, medicine and, and we should be convinced that things are beneficial 
um, for people with mental health problems. I think we should hold those same standards for traditional and religious healers. Um, and when we, when I say beneficial, that can be defined by the community. It doesn't have to be defined in my terms as a psychiatrist. Um, so I, I think it is important to still have a, a critical inquiry and that there has not been enough of that. Um, in the review we, we recently did, um, we found some really interesting studies. There's a Cochrane review um, from China looking at um, sort of natural remedies, natural herbal remedies, which have been found to augment antipsychotic medication. Um, and so we, we don't know much about the mechanism of how that's happening. And the evidence is a little bit weak at the moment. We still need more rigorous studies, but that would be a very nice example. Um, but that's quite a biological example. There's also um, another, another review looking at Tai Chi and how that can augment and improve quality of life and functioning in people with severe mental disorders. And again, you know, there's not been many studies done and there need to be better quality studies. Um, but that would be something that we would be learning from ancient systems of medicine in China. Um, in Ethiopia, I, do, I don't really know enough. There's, there's um, a lot of work going on to try and map out herbal treatments more generally across health conditions. Um, so we would obviously hope that something could come from that. Ways of thinking, ways of, I, we need really good anthropological ethnographic studies and we haven't had those in Ethiopia so far. The interesting thing about that Chinese example you gave is that it constantly, in my opinion, keeps being wheeled out. Um, I've seen that written up in uh, the popular press several times that the Chinese have hit upon a new treatment for schizophrenia. And I have to say that it seems like there's an appetite to believe when you talk about hold other people to the same standards. There's an appetite to believe it when actually I'm not entirely convinced the evidence base for that particular treatment is that great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, time will tell, as I say, but it is suggestive as an adjunctive treatment. It doesn't seem to be very effective um, on its own. So compared to placebo, um, just giving the decoction on its own didn't seem to improve outcomes. But it, there's some preliminary evidence. And you, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's maybe an appetite to look for things um, and, and hope that they would work. But but of course, we all of our medications have come from somewhere. So I think um, that there's no reason to think that it, it wouldn't work. So we just have to make sure we get the right evidence. I think that many people hearing um, about Ethiopia and low income countries and, and you already talked about the fact that often these people are facing a battle for survival that you're trying to help would would um, have an knee jerk reaction that mental health care is like at the bottom of the list of um, the priorities. My, my own view, of course, is that um, suffering is suffering and people can suffer hugely as a result of mental health problems and that needs to be addressed. But do you feel that there is a battle that psychiatrists face in particular or psychiatry compared to the rest of medicine to get that into um, places that are struggling with lots of other problems? For sure, places like Ethiopia have, have very um, significant competing priorities um, to be considered. Um, but when we go into a community um, and we ask about we describe what a person with severe mental illness might look like. We don't find that the community says, oh, no, they're fine. They don't need any intervention. Um, there's a full recognition um, that, that this person has something which is really problematic um, and is causing them suffering and causing them and their family um, harm. Um, but what they don't have is an, is an awareness of potential treatments um, that could help. So I, I think we don't really face that people's... Well, once we come in and say, look, let, let's show you what we might be able to do, even through very basic care delivered in primary care, and what we found is the community has been very receptive to that and, and said, you know, we feel we're more able to... These are people we wanted to help more. So it was... The prioritisation was also partly about having something to do, having some effective intervention. Um, so things get pushed down the priority list when, when it's felt that there's nothing that can be done. So I think that's part of it. Um, of course, in, in Global Mental Health, we're, we're very mindful of how mental illness interacts with poverty. Um, and I think we've been able to build up a really good evidence base that shows that 
um, the best way to reduce poverty in somebody with severe mental illness is to provide mental health care. They also need livelihood support because often they're marginalised and excluded families. But providing mental health care can be a poverty reduction strategy. So that is quite a powerful message. And of course, we're able, there's a lot of evidence also from the public mental health literature that mental health conditions are relevant for many of the priorities in Ethiopia, especially around HIV adherence to medication, if somebody has comorbid, if they also are affected by depression and that, that mental health problem is not detected, then you cannot effectively treat the HIV. And this is this is increasingly understood and, and has been a very powerful message. So we don't find, for example, that the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, we, we find that they're receptive, that they understand about the mental health problem. What they want us to come with is feasible contextually appropriate and acceptable ways of intervening to address the problem. Charlotte, thank you very much indeed. Is there anything else, we're running out of time a little bit, anything else you wanted to say um, that you think would be useful for people to know in terms of your research and your experience? Um, no, I mean, I think what's been really interesting when we look at sort of the the recent publications in the area of global mental health, especially for people with severe mental disorders, there's really an emphasis on providing better care and more care so that people um, are more able to get back to their, their normal lives and re-engage with communities. But there's also been a revisiting of some of the things that the taken for granted assumptions um, about the role of culture um, and stigma. And I think there has been a bit of romanticization sometimes about how those interplay with mental health problems. And it's really good to see that there's a lot more critical inquiry about these issues. So we, for example, assume that caregivers can, uh, that there's a, a great caregiving network within communities, um, which means that there's less onus on the mental health care system or healthcare systems to provide these kind of treatments. But of course, when you, you look in depth, you realise that um, caregiving is, is really a very big challenge and families are doing it out of sense of obligation, but um, it is also pushing the whole household in, into poverty um, and having consequences, not just for the caregiver, but for subsequent generations who might be having to be pulled out of school. So these kind of, these sort of um, thinking more critically about what it means to have social capital and connectedness of communities, um, I think is really welcome because that will help us to direct our efforts more, more fruitfully in the future. Charlotte Hanlon, Hanlon, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that We've been talking to Charlotte Hanlon from the Department of Psychiatry at the Addis Abada University in Ethiopia. And just to give you some titles of the recent papers that we've been um, talking a little bit about, and um, we'll make an attempt to see if we can get um, access to some of those papers on the Royal College website. Um, one paper is called Next Steps for Meeting the Needs of People with Severe Mental Illness in Low and Middle Income Countries. That was published in Epidemiology and Psychiatric Services um, and published in Current Opinion in Psychiatry in February 2018. Uh, the title is Global Mental Health and Schizophrenia. And Charlotte has been writing these papers often in collaboration with other people. And the final paper I want to mention is Task Sharing for the Care of Severe Mental Disorders in a Low Income Country, Study Protocol for a Randomized Controlled Non-Inferiority Trial. Charlotte Hanlon. Thank you very much indeed. Stay on the line. We're going to just disconnect into the recording, but I want to just chat to you a little bit longer. Um, so stay on the line. Don't go away. But thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you.